Hey, thanks for tuning in this week's online message. If you've been with us, you saw that last week we made a shift after Father's Day getting into this new series going through the book of James. And I, we started this and I, I shared how uh, the book of James has actually been a really hard book over the years for me to go through because I don't believe I literally had the right perspective when I read it. And so when you study James's life and you look at when this is written and where it's at, like there's a point in him that he's not far from actually uh, finding the end of his life. And in that, it's almost like he's taking his last moments to just throw out everything that he thinks is important for us to know. And so I, I share how I always had the wrong perspective and how I look at James now. And so that's why in the title you'll see it have a tagline rooted in verse 2. And what it's rooted in is, is what I think we need to shift our perspective to when we read the book of James. Because it says in, in James 1 verse 2, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, that whenever you face trials of many kinds. That, that whole concept of consider it pure joy. And we talked about the need to see our trials not as punishments, but as, as God's grace. We talked about verses 3 and 4 last week where it says, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let the perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Meaning that our trials actually serve a purpose. They serve a purpose in our life. They are teachable moments. They show us how much faith we have. They show us areas of improvement. They show us areas of sin. They show us areas of purity and goodness, but they also show us areas of God's provision and his blessings. And so if we shift our perspective to seeing our trials as something that is beneficial, then we can do what James is talking about here and consider it pure joy. Because that's totally against our culture and our society. It's against our own nature because the last thing we want to do is enter in or be in any kind of trials or hardships of any kind. And today I want to carry on through this first chapter here and work through the next little bit of scripture in that which are verses 5 through 8. And so this is what James 1 5 through 8 says. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So what, what it's talking about is finding wisdom. And if you were to read the rest of that, that passage on what he's talking about here in wisdom, it's, it's actually verses like 9 through 18. You'll see all kinds of different things it starts to talk about. It starts about talking about the need of seeing the difference in, in choosing things and understanding things and avoiding some things. And ultimately, all of chapter 1 is an overview of the, the 12 things that he's trying to teach us through the rest of the book of James. And so in order to do what we need for wisdom, we have to learn how to seek wisdom from the book of James. And so in seeking wisdom, we can apply this to the other wisdom books of the Bible, like Proverbs and whatnot, but how do you seek wisdom? Well, the passage provides practical guidance here on how to seek wisdom from God. We need to break down these verses in order to see what it is James is trying to teach us to understand the process and the principles. And so the very first thing that we see him teaching us here is, is that it's important that we acknowledge our need for wisdom. Have you really thought about how, how much wisdom you really need? Do you have a need for wisdom in your life? Well, when we look at this in James 1.5, it begins with the recognition of our need for wisdom. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom. I want to stop right there. Because when I think about this, if anyone lacks wisdom, like it's easy, right? You can ask people, you can do all of these things. But I, I think this is where we miss the point and the significance of what he's trying to tell us here. I don't think we always fear the Lord as we should. And I think we actually get arrogant and passive in our asks of the Lord. So look at what's going on here. You know, this first step in seeking wisdom it is 
to recognize and admit that we need it. How many times do we say, Lord, can you just tell me this? Lord, can you help me with this? Lord, how about this? You know what, Lord, I carved out 10 minutes of time for you today. I need you to tell me what you want here. And think about that concept. Think about the arrogance that that sounds like talking to something that should be our everything, something that is in deservance of our worship, in surrendering our life to. And so when I think about that, have that idea of being arrogant and passive in my asking, I mean, the first step of seeking wisdom is to recognize that we admit it. If I rest in that, that means it requires two things, humility and awareness. You know, those two factors are necessary because we have to understand that we are limited. So if you don't humble yourself, you won't accept that. And you will still think you are smarter, that you know more, that your way is better. We must acknowledge that true wisdom only comes from the Lord and not from our own intellect and our own experiences. Which leads us into the second point that James tries to teach us about wisdom is that we need to ask God for wisdom. In the rest of verse 5, it says, You should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So James is instructing us to ask God for wisdom. This act of asking is an expression of our faith. Think about throughout our day. How many decisions do we make that we never take to the Lord? Things that we probably should. I mean, if we start to shift our perspective to asking the Lord for that wisdom, we are actually producing an act of worship in us and, and ultimately expressing our faith and a deepening of our faith in Him. It's an expression of our dependence on God. And it's important to note that God gives wisdom generously and without any reproach. So He does not criticize us for lacking wisdom. As a matter of fact, he wants us to ask and draw near to him for the answers. But instead, he is really willing and ready to provide it when we're willing to ask for it and ask for it genuinely. So how do we do that? Well, one way is through our prayer. And so we approach God in our prayer. We approach the, the throne of the Lord boldly in our prayer, specifically asking for wisdom. And to make this a regular part of our daily prayer life. If we do not abide in him, then we're not really going to know him. And abide in him is to dwell with him. And the more we dwell and we have our prayer time with him, the more and more we'll draw near and develop the need and the understanding and receive the wisdom that we're asking for. Another way is through the scriptures. Because if we seek wisdom through reading and, and meditating on God's word, the Bible is a rich source of divine wisdom, the very divine wisdom that came from the Lord himself. But as we get into verse 6, we can see the third point that James is trying to teach us about wisdom, and that is to ask with faith. And I don't know if people always understand, but verse 6 says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave in the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Faith is essential when asking for wisdom. We must believe that God hears our prayers and that we'll provide for what we truly need. When we doubt those things, it can hinder the reception of those gifts from God in our life. And James uses this analogy of a wave and the idea of illustrating that doubt makes us unstable and unsettling as we're tossed back and forth because we don't have a foundation. We're not rooted in the faith and the foundation of that. So how do we do that? Well, we've got to learn to trust in God's character, to believe in God's goodness and his generosity, to trust that he desires to give us wisdom. The other thing we have to do is avoid doubt because when we guard against the skeptical or the uncertain attitude, Scripture will say to... to take your thoughts captive and make them obedient to the word of God. It, it strengthens your faith by, by recalling God's faithfulness in your past. And in verses 7 and 8, there's a fourth thing that James really draws out about wisdom that's important for us to know, and that is to understand the consequences of doubt. So when we read in these verses, it says that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. 
See, James is warning that if we are we have doubting hearts, that our doubting hearts ultimately lead to unstableness. It's the difference in, in building a house on rock and building it on sand. If we are double-minded, if we are asking God for things, but then we're, we're doing what we want. If we're seeking the wisdom of the world and trying to seek the wisdom of the Lord and we're choosing back and forth, then, then we haven't chose him fully. If we're double-minded, ultimately we're wavering between faith and doubt. And it affects all areas of our life at that point. And it makes us unreliable because we're not standing on any kind of foundation. So to, to receive wisdom from God, we need to be single-minded single and we need to be single-mindedly devoted in trusting the Lord himself. And we can overcome by several things. We can overcome by cultivating a single-mindedness in our life. So how do we do that? We focus our heart and our mind on God's promises, on God's commands, on what God is asking for us as a life, and to avoid being swayed by circumstances or any negative thoughts coming into our life. Like negativity is just as much of a poison as complaining, and those two things go hand in hand on the idea of breaking down when we're called to be thankful and a heart of gratitude and to be uplifting and encouraging. All of that tears that down in the negativity that comes. But we also need to find consistency in our faith. And we do that by practicing consistency in regular prayers, in the importance of gathering in worship and having fellowship with other believers. You know, uh, Hebrews would talk about not forsaking the gathering and the breaking of bread with one another so that you have to develop some disciplines in your life to, to make these disciplines every day in seeking wisdom. And here are some really practical steps that we can use to do that with what we already have. You know, the very first one is what is your prayer life like? If it's not very much or if it's pretty much like a checkbox or every once in a while, I would revisit and evaluate your daily prayer life. You know, look at it and make it a habit. And make it a habit to ask God for wisdom in your daily prayers. Be specific about the areas where you really need guidance. Another way is to study the scriptures. Because committing to regular Bible study, like, like for instance here at the church, I have been praying and praying and praying that we could launch life groups. Because life groups become so beneficial of a group of people learning to, to fellowship together, depend on each other, grow a community together, doing life together, caring for one another, being there as Christ would ask us to be. It changes people's lives. And so to bring people together in the Lord, you develop lifelong relationships that way. But you can also reflect on the passages that speak about wisdom and read things like Proverbs and the teachings of Jesus and do that together. But we can also practically seek wisdom in our life in seeking godly counsel. You know, surrounding yourself with wise people, mature Christians who can offer you discipleship, growth in the Lord, accountability, uh, advice that would be godly, not worldly, support that would be the support and accountability to bring you back to the cross and hold you accountable to Christ's behavior and Christ's choices over just being maybe something that would bring peace and be a people pleaser. Which leads to another way of practicality is the importance of listening and obeying. To be attentive to the Holy Spirit as, as he he provokes us and, and we respond to that in our life. His guidance to be willing to follow God's direction even when it's challenging. And really the last way that I've been able to help seek wisdom in my life is, is reflection and journaling. I'm really big on reflection because I think if we, if we don't choose to reflect, then these are the places like last week I talked about uh, we can get stuck when the trial is over, that we forget the enduring and persevering to the treasures that the Lord has for us. And in reflecting and seeing the encouragement in the things we did well, but then the reflection on the things that we need to change. Helping purify us to become more of Christ-likeness.
but by reflecting and journaling and we do that to keep a journal of our prayers of the things we've asked for in wisdom we can see how god answers them and if we see how god answers them, this practice can actually strengthen our faith and trust in the lord helping us to step out more and help us to recognize and see god's hand in our life more often and so going through the book of james as we carry on these verses five through eight they really provide a really clear approach to seeking wisdom from god and it's so easy to get wrapped up in all these other things of the world but when is the last time that you gave the reverence to the Lord in the asking for him to share with you the answers to the things that you were truly seeking, recognizing your need, asking God with faith and avoiding the doubt, finding self-control to not take it over, to not make your own choices, to not chase after your desires, to be patient waiting on the Lord. By consistently applying these principles, you can grow in wisdom and become more aligned with God's will for your life. You know, when we, we trust in God's promises to generously provide wisdom, we can, we can guarantee he does provide that wisdom for those who seek with the right heart and those who seek for his answers and not ours. And to do that has to be a faithful, believing heart. And that's my prayer for everyone, that we would see the importance and the need to seek the wisdom. And when we seek it, that we seek it with the heart of God's answers and not our own. And that we would do something with the wisdom that has been given to us. And that we would choose it even when it would be ch challenging. So Heavenly Father, I come to you today, Lord and Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the heart that you put in us. I thank you for the heart of stone that is removed and the heart of flesh that is given when we give our life to you. And Lord, there's so much that we need to know. Scripture tells us that our thoughts are not your thoughts. Our ways are not your ways. And Lord, we are asking for the wisdom to become more your ways and more of your, your light. To help us to align, to become more Christ-like in the choices we make. Lord, would you please provide that wisdom for us? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for tuning in this week's message. We'll see you as we continue down this road of the book of James. We'll see you next time.